In the movies, we can usually tell who's the hero and who's the villain. Sometimes, it's as easy as black and white. But in the rough and tumble days of the 1860s, a moral compass can sometimes be hard at the spot. When opportunity meets desperation, and ambition meets greed, you'll find men who are willing to risk it all, especially when there's gold involved. Henry Plummer was born William Henry Plummer in 1832 Edison, Maine. The youngest of six, Plummer's family had roots in Maine that dated back to the 1600s. When Plummer was a teen, he lost his father. And at 19, Plummer left Maine and headed for California, hoping to strike a rich in the gold mines. Within two years out west, Plummer had himself a mine, a ranch, and a bakery. In 1856, Plummer was elected sheriff and city planner of Nevada City, California. But Plummer's success in California was about to take a turn. On September 28, 1857, Henry Plummer was helping a woman named Lucy Vetter. She was trying to leave her abusive, inept gambling husband, John Vetter. Plummer had Lucy set up for the 2 a.m. stage. While she was packing her clothes, Plummer stood guard. Tiptoeing up the stairs was John Vetter. He swung open the door and shouted, Your time has come. Then fired two shots with his pistol. Both missed. Plummer returned fire. He didn't. Vetter was shot dead. Town folk accused Plummer of having an affair with Vetter's wife, and that Plummer murdered him. Plummer insisted it was self-defense. Plummer was tried and convicted. He was sentenced to 10 years in San Quentin Penitentiary. But only two years of his sentence was served when letters on Plummer's behalf urged the governor for an early release because of Plummer's good character and honorable civic performance. But it wasn't letters that released Plummer, rather an illness. Plummer had consumption, what was later named as tuberculosis, the uncurable, at that time. So the governor pardoned Plummer. After his release, Plummer went back to Nevada City, where he was known to frequent saloons and whorehouses. He would drink and mix it up alongside the men he used to arrest. In 1861, Plummer got into a dispute with a man named William Riley, an escaped convict at the time. They say Riley pulled out a knife, Plummer pulled out a gun. Riley was killed. Plummer turned himself into police who agreed the killing was justified. But because of his checkered past and prison record, they thought Plummer wouldn't get a fair trial. So they let Plummer out to jail and told him he needed to leave the state. And so he did. He headed up north for the Washington Territory, where he got into another dispute. A gunfight ensued, and Plummer was left standing. It was at this time he decided he had enough of the West and was going back home. On his way back east, as Plummer was waiting for a steamboat with a friend, Jack Cleveland, he meets a man named James Vale, who needed help protecting his family from Native American attacks at the Sun River Mission. They both agreed and soon became infatuated with Vale's sister-in-law, Electa Bryan. Plummer asked Electa to marry him, and she agreed. So Plummer then heads for Bannock, Montana, as were a spread of gold that had been recently discovered nearby. Plummer's friend Cleveland tagged along. In January 1863, in a crowded saloon, Cleveland, drunk and still jealous about Plummer and Electa, antagonizes and provokes Plummer, questions his manhood, goes too far. Plummer's had enough. He responds by saying, I'm tired of this, draws his gun and fires one shot into the ceiling and one shot into Jack Cleveland, killing him. A jury would later decide that the shooting was in self-defense. Plummer was viewed very favorably by most town residents, except the acting sheriff and butcher, Hawk Crawford. Plummer and Crawford built up a mutual disdain for each other, probably because Plummer wanted to be sheriff. They exchanged threats, until one day, Sheriff Crawford sees Plummer standing across the street, and with his double-barrel shotgun, takes a shot at Plummer, hitting him in the arm. Plummer survives. Later that year, Plummer runs for town sheriff against Crawford. He wins, and is elected sheriff of Bannock. That summer, Electa split from Plummer and moved back home. No one knew why. In the months that followed, a rash of stagecoach robberies and murders started popping up around Bannock and Virginia City. To put in perspective, Virginia City had a population of 4,000 people in 1862. By 1863, that number swelled to 15,000. That high volume of new arrivals hoping to make their claim in the gold and silver mines, coupled with a lack of traditional law, gave rise to the bandits and desperate men looking for an easy score. With so much gold and silver moving out of the Idaho territory, it wasn't a difficult choice for some men to ambush these stagecoaches. A gang known as the Innocents 
deputized men, road agents, outsiders, said to be led by no other than Sheriff Henry Plummer, were frequently mentioned as the culprit for these robberies and murders, said to have secret passwords and signals, even tying their knots in a specific way. The aunt of vigilante prosecutor Wilbert Sanders describes the outlaw band's countless atrocities. The sheriff was the captain, Mary Edgerton wrote, and the victims were murdered and robbed and their bodies cut into pieces and put under the ice, others burned and others buried. Reports can only substantiate at least 10 confirmed killings, but what was for sure, the miners and town folk around Bannock and Virginia City did have a problem. A gang of murderous thieves were preying on the gold surrounding the region. A witness said they recognized Plummer at one of the robberies. At first it was dismissed as rumor, but as the robberies and murders became more frequent, the people started to question their watchful sheriff. So in late 1863, the Montana Vigilantes was formed. From the months of October of 1863 to February of 64, the vigilantes chased down and hung over 20 road agents, suspected members of the Plummer Gang. On January 11, 1864, the vigilantes hung Dutch John Wagner, who previously confessed to the crimes, naming Plummer as the leader, along with deputies Buck Stinson and Ned Ray. By this time, the vigilantes were convinced that Plummer was the ringleader of the Innocence Gang, and on January 10, 1864, Plummer and his two deputies were hanged at the Hangman's Gulch in Bannock. Before Plummer died, he was quoted as saying, Let me get a high drop, boys. He was only 32 years old. The hanging of Sheriff Plummer and his subsequent guilt has been a debate for years. Was he the leader of a ruthless gang whose members ranged in the hundreds? with secret signs and a network of watchful spies? Or was he the soft-spoken man from Maine, who came to the West as an entrepreneur, and was unlawfully hanged without sufficient evidence from the people he was protecting? We might never really know. All we know is that this story is just another interesting page in history.